let's um, kind of close with where we close with most of our patients, and that's in the refractory setting. And I, I kind of like to set this stage, because this is a different patient. We were talking about kitchen sink aggressive frontline therapy. This is a patient that we now know pretty well. We've known him for two, three, sometimes longer years. Um, they have a favorite parking spot at the infusion unit. They know the people at the front desk, right? They know when, yep. you're, when GI ASCO is, so they <laughs> reschedule their appointment with us, right? You know these people, right? And, um, and, and there are different, they've actually said the word hospice at the kitchen table, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they want to stay alive, but they also have an increasing value around quality of life. And we now have, um, a new uh, world of treatments for refractory uh, disease. And, and Tony, we're going to let you start uh, with the regorafenib story because we have a little bit more experience with this medicine. Yes. So set us up there. So, uh, and, and as you said, you know, this is thankfully becoming a, a little bit more crowded than it used to be. Uh, so regorafenib is, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a multi-targeted, so it's a dirty, promiscuous uh, oral agent that hits VEGF but also hits others that are not just involved with the micro, with the microenvironment but also directly hits some uh, tumor targets. Uh, uh, regorafenib uh, is, as I said, an oral agent and in, in uh, uh, two trials, two large randomized trials, consistently showed improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival in patients uh, with metastatic colorectal cancer beyond uh, 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 standard therapy. So uh, patients progressed on Fulfiri, Folfox, EGFR inhibitors if they were uh, KRAS wild type. So I think that's really important. This is real-time patients. Mm -hmm. These had received all of the uh, U.S. accessible mm -hmm. drugs, right? So lots of places around the yes. world can't get all of these drugs. Absolutely. So this was done in our backyard um, and these are our kinds of patients, right? And so do you think this, the results of this study, what do they do to your practice? How do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, so the results, actually, the hazard ratios were very interesting. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has, this, this agent has actually made it where naturally it was studied. Um, after patients failed two or three lines of therapy, uh, patients eventually progressed to regorafenib. And that's where naturally it found its place in, in my practice. All right, so, um, you know, I think when this drug first came out, lots of us were holding patients off, tr waiting for the drug, and their performance status was falling, and we tried it, and it didn't work very well, and it was toxic to them. Um, how's your experience over the last year or so been in terms of changing your use and when you think about using this drug? Getting a little more savvy about dosing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly, I think in my own practice, the 160, only maybe 10% of patients tolerate the full dose of regorafenib. So it's, 160, where do you start? I said 120. 80. 80! So one, 160. You're, you're a full doser. I've recently become a 120 -er, but, mm -hmm. uh, it's but I think there's, but anyway, I'll let you let the yeah. floor back over sure. here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think a couple things. One is I, I start at 120 now, but I do a lot of education with the patients. Mm -hmm. And I think our nurses also know a little bit more about these regorafenib patients that when we see the toxicity, at least in my experience, it's been early. Mm -hmm. And so you start to get a little bit more tired. You start to get a little hand foot early syndrome. Early meaning? First week, yeah. first week or two. And so I stress the importance of the patients need to call in if they're having a problem and I do see them for the I do the see them weekly for that first cycle until I get their dose down and sometimes I can bump it up sometimes I have to take it down yeah, and the original study said you see them every two weeks and then you know when it first came out make sure you see them monthly and, yeah. and we've basically learned that you got to got to see them uh, uh, sooner How do you, what do you tell a patient how do you, you use some of the language you use to describe uh, this drug to a patient. Yeah. So I think, you know, the toxicity wise, the, probably the most common toxicity we see with this drug is fatigue, hand foot skin reaction, and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And usually the hand foot skin reaction is dose dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I, so I, I definitely have to be proactive. My nurses are proactive telling some kind of side effect they may expect. I do see them once a week. But clinically, we've had experience doing this with other drugs, such as capsidabine and serafinib. So this is nothing new in terms of dose modification. I don't think nobody starts capsidabine at full dose, or even serafinib, we start at half the dose, try to tighten it up. And so it took us a year or two or three exactly to figure right. that out, right? So we didn't know is, it right out of the gate. Yeah, this is the same learning curve we're having with regorafenib. 
Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think being proactive is very important, educating the patient what to expect. If you see them once a week and if the side effect occurs, you could dose reduce right away so that the patient could get through the second cycle so they could get a CAT scan to see if, this, if it's effective or not. Tony, I know you fiddle with doses all the time, so why are you holding firm on this one? Uh, so m my concern uh, is that those patients have a medium progression-free survival that's equivalent to the first scan. So toying around with a dose that may be effective, which uh, Johanna, uh, Johanna mentioned 10% in the study, it's about 20%. So f the, the, the majority of the patients do not tolerate the 160, but you have a baseline patients who tolerate it and who may benefit from it. And toying around with the dose uh, 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 when, when your lifespan is limited uh, is a bit problematic and as everyone is saying you know we're learning more about the drug we know how to support our patients in fact the toxicities do happen if you pay close attention to them in the first uh, two to three weeks and they're dose dependent you reduce the dose most of these patients can continue through the drug the good news is actually we do have a study now uh, that's underway that's looking at the two approaches either you start patients at 160 or you start patients at 80 and, and then escalate within within a month and uh, uh, we have about 20%, about 20% accrued on that trial. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have actually some kind of an idea about whether uh, dose escalation versus starting at higher dose matters. And uh, we're hoping uh, that we can answer this question soon. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really yeah. important that they're taking the responsibility, yeah. supporting investigator-initiated yeah. studies to answer this question Absolutely. so we can make sure we're not losing efficacy, yeah. uh, we can reduce the dose. Yeah, I mean, I think Tony's study is very important because this, you know, the jury isn't in on how we do this drug. It's an important drug, right? We mm -hmm. want to use it. Mm -hmm. And I know I came in on the low end across, <laughs> across the panel on starting the dose, but the problem is, is that you know, these are patients who are at the, uh, reaching the end of the line, and if you give them something that's toxic at the onset, they quit. Mm. So, and, and I want to make sure that they do benefit from the drug. So I escalate from 80, but I start at 80, and I look forward to seeing what Tony's studies show. Between sort of recycling chemotherapy, we've got Oxtil in our back pocket, and changing out volume of disease performance status, is there, are there, is, uh, my practice has been to not lose this chance, not leave it too long on the table, because if they're going downhill, you'll, you won't do what you need to do. So using it earlier, maybe as a tee up for clinical trials later, is that similar to what you guys are doing? Have you shifted to an earlier time point when you're using it? Uh, not earlier line of therapy necessarily, but, but yes. pre-phase one, pre-recycle yeah, of chemotherapy. Definitely, I think, I think you, you, of course, lose activity uh, uh, for any of these drugs in the later lines if you wait until the patient you know, has a performance status of two plus or three, they're less likely to benefit from it. And frankly, they're more likely also to see the toxicities we're concerned about. Uh, and so yes, it does make more sense to actually place it uh, as part of our standard of care before you know, we start thinking. Again, clinical trials are very important and there are certainly some fantastic phase one trials that would be fitting, but before getting to the end of the line phase one trial, uh, the PK trial or the phase zero trial.